a 14-year-old boy shot and killed an innocent teenager to prove himself to his gang. At the trial, the victim's mother sat still and silent until the end when he was convicted of the killing. As he was being taken away in handcuffs, the mother of the boy who was shot stood up slowly, looked him in the eye, and said, I'm going to kill you and sat back down, and the boy was taken away. After being in prison for a year or so, the mother of the slain boy goes to visit him. Now that boy had been living on the streets before the killing, and she was the only visitor he ever had. Not even the gang members came to visit him. Now he was kind of frightened before she came, but she said, no, I I just want to talk to you. And for a time, they talked, and when she left, she gave him some money for cigarettes. And then she started step-by-step visiting him more regularly, trying to understand the guy who killed her child. And she goes every few months. And when he's about to get out at the age of 18, she asks him, what are you going to do when you get out? He said, I've, I've got no idea. I've got no family. I, I don't know. She said, well, I, I've got a friend who owns a little factory, and maybe I can get you a job there. So she arranges it with the parole officer. And then she said, where are you going to stay? He said, I, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't, I don't have anybody. She said, well, I've got a spare room, and you can stay with me. So he comes and stays with her. So after six months, she pulls him aside and she says, you know, I I really got to talk to you. Come on in the living room and, and sit down. Let's talk. So she sits opposite to him and looks him in the eyes and says, do you remember in court the day you were convicted of murdering my son for no reason at all? And I said, I was going to kill you. He said, yes, ma'am. I'll never forget that day. She looked back at him and said, well, I did. I did not want the boy who murdered my son to live on this earth anymore. I wanted him to die. And and that's that's how I set about changing you and, and bringing you things and giving you a job and letting you live here with me. And you're not that same person anymore. That old boy, he's gone. But I don't have anybody. And I want to know if you would stay here. I want to know if I could adopt you as my son. And he said yes. And she became the mother of her son's killer. The mother that he never had. We're starting our series called Surprise the World. And there's oftentimes nothing more surprising than grace and mercy shown when we never expect grace and mercy to be shown. To understand that God's love for us is, <clears throat> is incomprehensible at times. And when we see it reflected in other people, we are shocked and surprised by it. And <clears throat> hearing something like this, it, it oftentimes shocks us. Some people really like this story. Some people really don't. As I was reading through the comments section on the video where I found this, I, was, uh, I shouldn't be surprised if you ever want to lose faith in humanity, go to the comments section on anything. Um, <clears throat> But just seeing people, just they thought there should be eye for an eye and, and different thoughts like that. But that's where the, the best of what the church can be, the best of what grace can be, it comes a place where we surprise the world with extreme acts of humanity. 
and, and change and challenging the way that people see each other, that challenge the way we interact with each other, and it's that idea of surprising. People have come to expect certain behaviors from, from certain groups, and, and it's really hard and difficult to surprise people these days. It's hard to surprise um, the world. It's, the world is we're often jaded and uh, uh, kind of sometimes we'll laugh and say, if you don't think the world's jaded, just spend some time around a 13-year-old and, and, uh, or just a middle schooler in general. It's, you can't surprise them. They, they know it all. And I remember knowing it all, so I can't get too mad at middle schoolers for this. But it's that idea that to surprise someone, but when we do, it catches us off guard. And that's the, the, the beauty and the nature of God's grace is about re- uh, surprising but see, the thing is, the trouble is what I see in, in Western churches is that we've, no one's surprised by the church anymore. They're not surprised by the things we do, and not always because of good things. Uh, when the church is generous, generally people are like, well, the church is supposed to give to those certain things. That's good that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Every once in a while, something extraordinary will happen. Uh, there was, recently, there was um, uh, some things that were going around about a couple churches that, that paid a, a million dollars worth of medical debt in their community for people that weren't even in their church, just out in the community in general. And that surprised people. When the Amish community several years ago, there was a shooting within uh, with them, and they ended up forgiving. Um, now, again, forgiving doesn't take away accountability. So we're not talking about people not going to jail, but forgiving them, it surprised the world. Like, what, what an amazing act of grace that was. In Charlottesville, there was a shooting in the church uh, several years ago. And I don't know if you watched uh, um, afterwards as family members of those who died in that, they forgave the shooter. And uh, it was a, a video testimony of this, of them doing this. And they said they didn't condone the acts. And so there's a difference there in how we engage, but engaging the people. And so when people see that, they're surprised. They say they're surprised. We see stories like this. There's a surprise there. But oftentimes what happens is the church interacts with the world in an unsurprising world. They come to expect churches to be defensive about certain things, to, uh, to get mad about certain things, to be judgmental about certain things. Um, they're usually only surprised if they see extreme acts of forgiveness and humility. They're surprised when they see grace aimed at outsiders. And that's the question. Are we losing our ability to surprise? Where is it that we've lost um, that spark in our life? Surprises are good. There's something wonderful and powerful about uh, surprises. I, I, I love a, a good surprise. I love being surprised. I've seen and read so many stories that if I find a book or something that uh, that really catches me off guard. I'm delighted by it. Or a movie that, um, uh, that just really catches me off guard. I'll think about it for, for days and sometimes years or some movies. That really surprised me how that was told, um, how fantastic. I don't know how many of you like uh, magic tricks and card tricks, and I'm not a ma- magician. Um, I almost said I'm not a musician. I am that, um, but I'm not a magician. And, uh, um, and so, but there's a lot of card tricks we come, uh, come to know. And so um, what I'd like to do, uh, Jeff, would you come up here and help me um, with a card trick? And what I'd like you to do is uh, um, I'm going to fan out some cards, and you just pick uh, your favorite one. See if you see. Any of them, Lou? All right. Don't show it. Don't, um, I didn't see it. Um, you're not showing it to me, are you? No. You can show it to the congregation. Um, you can show it to them if you want. You can show it to them. You can turn around and show it to them. Um, all right, so. Thought he was going to. All right, so don't tell me what it is. Now, what I'd like you to do is uh, I want you to put it here on face down, face down right there. All right. And so then we take this here. Now, this is a trick. You probably figured out already what, how I'm going to do this, but you can stay up here if you'd like to. Um, I, I mean, I may need you. And. Uh, um, you weren't dismissed. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the cards and I'm going to tell you which card um, w- was yours. And so I'm going to get there and we're going to see the card and I'm going to tell you if the card is still in here. And I'm not seeing your, your card. I don't know if it's really in here or not. That's not it. And so I'm getting, are you sure that you put the card? All right. So. So maybe, all right, let me try this again. Sorry about this. I tell you, I, you'd think after three services I would get this right. So, all right, so I open up, 
So usually what happens is, let me tell you how it's supposed to work. And so, all right, so you go up, and the sleight of hand is this one. You should go, oh, I look over here, and I suddenly look at this card while they're looking at this card. And then they put that card down, face down. I put this up, and then I shuffle them slightly, not too much. And then when I get to the, that was a ten of hearts. When I get to the ten of hearts, I flip it over and I go, oh, the next one is obviously Jeff's card. But the problem is Jeff has tricked me somehow, and his card is not in here, and I think you've been in cahoots with someone. Um, Pansy, you're the most likely culprit here. Pansy, would you look at the hymn book that's in front of you, the hymnal? There's a hymnal in front of you. Is there a hymnal? And turn to page 77, if you would. Is there a card in there? Page 77? What's that? There's two cards in there. Two cards? Well, how did that happen? Is this your card? This is your card? And this is the one I was just looking at. This is your card. Are you sure? I don't know where this card came from. <laughs> I, I am just, is that you, Joey? <laughs> Did you mess with me? <laughs> How would you know where to put it? Yeah. So, <laughs> so surprises. You never know, but this is your card. How did it get from there to there? We'll never know. So, all right. That's right. It's hard to get good help, even my own. So, that is funny. Two cards. So, surprises. We get in there. You sit expecting one trick, and then another trick happens, and... Uh, Oh, and that's the way you watch those good magic tricks on TV. Now, these people are amazing what they can do. The, um, the sleight of hand, they, they practice hours and hours to do it because you're thinking they're going to show you one trick and then they show you another surprise. But that's it, is that people have come to expect from the church the same trick. They go, oh, this is what you're supposed to always do. And the thing is, we've got so many more tricks to do. And they're not tricks. I, I don't mean to use it that way, but um, so many different ways to surprise. And the best part about a magic trick is when you get someone say, how did he do that? Exactly. And so that's the moment. And that's it. To be the church, if we're living out the powerful presence of God where shaving cream is going everywhere and uh, making me nervous, and uh, that's it, is that we have this place where we surprise. Do we live in a way that people look at us and go, why do they live like that? That's an amazing thing. What's special about that? The question at the heart of this series is how do we come to start living a world that's uh, living in a way that surprises the world? At the heart of the Christian faith, there are a couple of different mandates that we have. One is from Matthew 23. And the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. They said, Teacher, which is the greatest of all the commandments? And there were a lot of commandments. Which is the greatest of all the commandments? And the law. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. I like that Jesus goes, hey, let me give you another one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. He's saying that all that is written is filtered through this idea of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then we get in the end of Matthew, and Jesus gives a mandate to his disciples, and he says to this, he says, All authority in heaven has been given, and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you all the all the days to the very end. See, and this is the comforting thought that Jesus goes, I'm calling you to go out and do this thing that might seem a little bit strange to you, but I'm with you. I'm always with you, working in and through you. But what I want you to do is go and teach people that the sum of this all, to love your Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself, to make disciples of people who are imitating and walking with me. That's the commandment. You see, Jesus, he doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the called. And so that's with us. We, we don't have to be uh, equipped a certain way. He goes, here, I'm just calling you, and I've loved you, and because God, I love you, go out and love others and show them how to do this, imitating me. 
The question that we have, though, is what does this look like? There can be many different ways of what we think this looks like. How do we love each other? How do we embrace the authority that Jesus gives us? And how do I live a life of love and mission in the image of Jesus Christ? The first one I want to say is oftentimes we can overthink this. I'm not saying that it's simple, but sometimes we make it too complex. Basically, what we're doing is we're called to walk with Jesus. The good news is that Jesus walks with us. And what does that mean? That means Jesus came to, to um, live in this life, and he comes to walk with us to show us how to live our life if he were living our life. Now, what that means, it doesn't mean that we all look the same or we act the same or we have um, the same personality. What it means is that Jesus says, with your personality, your situation in life, the family you were born in, let me show you how to live your life um, in, in the reflection of, of my love and do that. And so we're called to walk. Now, if there is walking involved, that means that there is this movement and that Jesus is going somewhere. And too often what we do is we end up staying stationary. We end up not moving. And so Jesus, I'm on the move. The church is a mission on the move that we are called to reflect the movement and the love of God. We are called to be a part of the work that Jesus is doing, to love the things that Jesus loves, to be a part, a part of the things that Jesus is a part of. And so with that Throughout Matthew, Jesus says several things. He says, behold, the kingdom of God is at, see if you can break the code, hand. Right, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, that doesn't mean that it's one day in the far off. He's saying it's right here. It says after, after um, church, we're going to lunch, and uh, we, there's Outback is right down the street. It says, behold, Outback is at hand. Let us enter in. That's it. I'm not saying outback is the kingdom of God, but I'm saying that we can, in that Jesus is saying there's break-ins of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not, and it's full yet. That's what one day Jesus will make all things new, but right now there are pockets of it. Now, Jesus reigns over all things, whether we recognize his reign or not. God is Lord of all. He is the God of God's Lord of lords. And, uh, and so we, we recognize that he reigns all. But when we begin to live in his reign and... Um, the reality of the kingdom begins to become more visible. And that's our call, to live in that reign of God, to make the reign of God visible where we are. Uh, Leslie Newbegin, he, uh, theologian, he says, the mission of the church is to alert everyone everywhere to the universal reign of God through Jesus Christ. That we are called to alert everyone everywhere to the universal reign of God through Jesus Christ. And so that idea, what does that mean to alert? And um, what does it mean to express what the kingdom of God is? Well, the kingdom of God, I want you to think about if the things that you think of that are happening in the kingdom of heaven, when all things are made new, do we reflect that in those little kingdoms that we see here now? Michael Frost, he talks about four key evidences of the, of the kingdom of God. Reconciliation, justice, beauty, and wholeness. The first one, he talks about reconciliation. In the kingdom of heaven, of course, there's going to be reconciliation. Reconciliation of individuals, relationships, reconciliation of races, reconciliation of nations, reconciliation of, of generations, um, reconciliation of uh, genders, reconciliation of, uh, of, of different uh, margins of society. Um, uh, it's a re reconciliation. Does our kingdom reflect the diversity of? Of God, And so when we look at the practices of the church, when we look at the practices of our own discipleship, do we reflect things that are about reconciliation? Are we creating a program and an atmosphere and a vision and a mission of doing that? Do all of our things have that idea of reconciliation in them? The second thing is justice. Justice is all throughout Scripture. It would be hard-pressed for anyone to um, argue with me that there's not a place for justice in, in Scripture. It's everywhere. Are we engaging in it? And, and the idea of justice, is there evidence of true justice, a place where no one is marginalized, where no one goes hungry, where we work to alleviate suffering and undo unjust social constructs in society? Do we as individuals and as a group do that, to raise an issue of, of not just about doing handouts for the poor, but do we engage in systems that break apart systemic um, causes of poverty? Are we a part of those things? If justice, we believe, is in heaven, then how do we enact it here down on earth? And beauty. 
God is about beauty. God is a, a God of creation, and we see arts of work, uh, whether it's fine arts, and we see music and, and paintings. We see it in our relationships and one another. We see the beauty of, of people and, and the, the souls that are around us. Do we cultivate that idea of beauty and hope and wholeness? Do we cultivate that idea? When we go out and see the, uh, the Grand Canyon or we see um, uh, Glacier National Park, we, we, we see Mount, uh, Katahdin and, and Maine, if we see the different beauties around the world and go, wow, in a sunset, we see the evidences of God and go, wow, God has walked here. Do we cultivate that? Genesis talks about being good stewards of creation. How are we in our stewardship of creation? It's all connected. It's there. These aren't political agendas. This is about God saying, how are we good stewards of beauty in our world? And the last one of wholeness. God was about wholeness. When John the Baptist um, wasn't sure about Jesus, he sent his disciples. He says, ask Jesus if he's really the Messiah, which is a great question anyway. And uh, the disciples do this. They go, hey, we're, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus says, go back and tell John what you see. And it's acts of wholeness. He says, tell him you see the, the blind have sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and those who are caught and imprisoned and broken and, and, and chains are set free. And think about that. Do we bring wholeness and peace? Are people being set free in their, um, in their lives? Are they finding redemption? Are, are being free from addiction? Are they being free from um, brokenness and abuse? Do we set out and have a, a, a policy of that in our churches and our home life? I want to ask you some questions. First, I want, uh, just based on the first two services, I, I need to say if you know how to say these two words. Yes? No. no. Okay. This, I know that you can participate now. In heaven, when you think God makes all things new, is there grace? Yes. Is there peace? Yes. Is there mercy? Yes. Is there justice? Yes. Reconciliation? Yes. Beauty? Yes. Hope? Yes. Wholeness? I, I'm repeating myself. All right. So we know that, so if they're there, and we're called to be reflections of that here, and Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand here, how are we living our life that reflect all of those things? Because if we're not, then we have to ask ourselves, are we truly walking in the kingdom of God that Jesus has laid out before us? Are we taking advantage of the life that Jesus has given us? It's not an easy question to answer. But it is an important one. We are called to alert people to the universal reign of Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm saying if we reflect those things, people are going to take notice and go, that's surprising. That's amazing. There's a great example that Michael Frost gives. And uh, um, I can't remember if he uses that in this book or, or, or not. But he, um, this is where I get, you're going to have to, um, you're gonna have to flex your Pentecostal muscle. Raise your hand if um, you've ever been to a movie. All right, yeah, okay, everyone's been to a movie. And so you've seen the previews. Now, um, most of us, there's oftentimes there be one preview that's uh, it's for the upcoming blockbuster, some movie that you really want to see. And the music hits you just right, and the feel-good words are just right, and it gives you a chill, and your, the hair on your arm stands up, and you're like, yeah, and you nudge your buddy next to you, and you go, I'm going to go see that. I mean, do you ever remember having any of those? Kind of, you're like, yes, I can't. I remember when the when Star Wars, the new new Star Wars came out, and I got really excited about uh, that, and, and I was like, this is exciting, and, the, and other movies, and I was like, yes, I can't wait to see that. Here's the thing. Heaven, when Jesus makes all things new, that is the ultimate blockbuster. We, you and I, are the preview to that, so that when people see us, they go, yes, I want to be a part of of that. I don't mean part of an organization, but I mean that we are f reflecting the love of God in such a way that that woman with, the, uh, with the, the, the murder who killed her son reflects the grace of God, that we live in such a way that people go, yes, I want that. It makes people curious. They go, what is this grace and love? It it matters. So when they ask you, you can go, there's this guy that saved my life. And that's why this beauty is here. And then they go, well, I want to know about that. Do we give reflection to that? You are the preview. You are the fort as that hymn says, a foretaste of the glory divine. People are going to nudge their neighbor and say, how do I get some, some of that? Next week, we're going to be talking about five habits that help us rediscover our call and mission as reflections of Jesus Christ. Five habits that we can live that reflect this, that can lead to surprising life. 
And um, they'll be simple, simply put, by the end of the series, you're going to have them ingrained in your head, and I'm going to talk about them every week from here on out. These five habits. Five habits, five things. We talk about platitudes in the church all night. It's great to say love your neighbor, but what does that mean? What does it look like in practice? What's something simple I can grab a hold of? We're going to unfold that over the next few weeks. I have time to tell you one story. I'm going to make time to tell you one more story. And again, it's a story I heard Michael Foss telling. And he was in Cambodia talking to some pastors. And um, they were all Asian. And he says, in this uh, community, most of the Asian pastors looked the same in the sense that they parted their hair basically the same way. They all wore white shirts and had black, black pants and black shoes. And they were in there, and he's, so he's teaching this class. On, and there was one guy in the back out of the, this room full of pastors that all looked like they were wearing the same thing. There was one guy in the back. His hair was all spiky, and he had a leather jacket on. He's wearing sunglasses. And, uh, um, he's, and afterward, and Michael Frost, he's a little distracted. He kept wondering, who is, who is this guy? He's thinking, well, maybe he's someone that uh, just wants to practice his English and then stop by. He, he wasn't sure. And afterwards, sure enough, the guy came up to Michael. And Michael said, I, I'm sorry, I don't um, mean to be offensive, but uh, surely you're not, uh, you're not a pastor here. And he says, well, actually, I, I am. And he says, I'm uh, colleagues with a lot of um, these other pastors. We have a lot of things in common. I, there's a few things that are different about me. And, and so Michael was curious. He said, well, tell me your story. And, and the guy says, well, several years ago, I'd finished Bible school. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with that, how I was going to make a living, support my family. And, and uh, I was really frustrated. I didn't know what to do next. And I was praying out to God and calling out to God, what do you want of me? And he was ready to just sort of ditch it all and, and go into the secular world. And, and God looked at this group across the river, which is basically, it was a shanty town. It was a impoverished town. It was uh, um, corrugated steel uh, homes and living in, in, in uh, um, uh, dirt and, and mud. And just when you think of the worst of poverty, this is what this place uh, looked like. And, and, he said, and he said, God was telling me that's my church. And just then, these trucks, these military trucks came in and with uh, um, bullhorns started calling out, you have 30 minutes to pack all your stuff up. We're moving you to a different area. The government is seizing that area and they wanted to build property on it. So these people were losing their home and their property. They only had 30 minutes to get their stuff together. Their kids and family are scattered out. This is how families get separated. And so you can hear people crying and, and calling out for their children and trying to get as much as they can to go. And, he, and Michael says, what do you do? He says, well, I followed them. So I got on my motorcycle and I followed to see where the government was going to take them. He took them to this other area and the, and the property was even worse. It was just uh, mud and, and dirt and a lot of water. There was just no, it was marshy. Um, where they were going, and uh, um, and so I just sort of started talking to people and looking around the area, and Michael says, well, what did you do? He says, well, I started thinking, in the kingdom of heaven, our homes, um, do they have water for floors? And the answer is no. And he says, so I went, and I started gathering some people, and I, found, I knocked on some church doors and some neighbors, and found some people to help, the, some ear, engineering problems, and we they started digging uh, trenches to drain the water off the plant so they could create a plain area so they dried the area to do that and then they started building their homes he says i'm looking at these these homes and they're all the steel cord this corrugated steel structures now i want you to think about uh um this part of asia i'm guessing the climate is very similar to our climate probably more humid and imagine living in a steel box it's like living in an oven now and so michael's like what did you do he says well i asked my he says i'm not a very clever person so i just asked god People sleep in ovens, live in ovens in heaven, and of course the answer is no. He says, so I went around and I, I knocked on neighbor's doors, church doors, and tried to find some people to get some money and supplies together so we could have different materials to build home. And so he just kept asking that question. He didn't have to be incredibly clever, he just had to ask a good question. Is this what is in heaven? If not, then how can I do something about it? That's the question for us, to live a surprising world to live a surprising way, to ask that question, is this situation something that exists in the kingdom of God? And if not, how do I live differently and lean into it? And remember, Jesus says, I'm with you. I'm with you to the end of the age. I invite you to pray with me now. Holy God, we want to be a part of your kingdom to learn how to live with you daily. And so we pray during this season, this time of year, that you would show us how we can surrender our lives to you that we might actually find our life in you.
Show us how to be a surprising force of your nature in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with me this morning as we sing our closing hymn, Take My Life.